good evening. Uh, my name is Miguel Petrosky, and I am a, a Christian writer and journalist uh, who will be helping moderating this conversation this evening uh, this, in partnership with ECPAT USA. ECPAT USA is the nation's first and oldest organization to address the issue of child sex trafficking and exploitation uh, in the United States. And uh, it is informed their work, ECPAT USA, their work is informed by uh, their Survivors Council, of which three of them are with me uh, this evening. And in the Survivors Council is a diverse group of women and men who have uh, drawn upon their own difficult histories to become leaders in the movement to protect other children and to uh, dismantle trafficking. Uh, I'm again very thrilled and I just want to note uh, that this webinar will be recorded. Uh, Katrina is a New York City realtor, an ECPAT USA board member, and ECPAT USA survivor council member. Um, appearing regularly as a speaker and panelist, uh, Katrina participates in conferences, workshops, training seminars, and other awareness events. And courageously, she has shared her story with uh, the Washington Times, CNN, MTVU, and through ECPAT USA's What Have I Been Through is Not Who I Am. And more re recently, she has appeared in the national MTAS, uh, More Than a Survivor campaign, which displays the lives of survivors, leader, uh, sur uh, leaders of survivors across the country. Uh, thank you, Katrina, for being here. Excuse me. Uh, Siflali uh, is a child trafficking survivor and member of ECPAT USA Survivors Council. And her goal is to make sure uh, that children uh, are across the United States won't have to go through the same experiences that she has gone through. Currently, Siklali is working on her bachelor's degree in social work and spends any free time she has with her daughter. Siklali, we thank you for being here this evening. From the age of 12 to 24 years old, Barbara Amaya was trafficked on the streets of New York City. She overcame heroin addiction, horrific trauma, brutal sexual abuse, domestic violence, and cancer that was directly related to sex trafficking. Today, Barbara Amaya is an award-winning advocate, speaker, best-selling author of Nobody's Girl, and a survivor leader in the movement to end human trafficking, and all violence against women and children. Barbara, Barbara thank you for uh, being here this evening. But we will have about 35 minutes for a moderated discussion between the panelists and myself, followed by a question and answer period in which you, the audience, will be able to submit questions and which uh, one of our panelists would be able to answer. And uh, I would finally have a concluding statement for two minutes afterwards. And again, just to remind you all, this will be uh, recorded this webinar. All right, we will move to the moderated discussion. Uh, my first question I'm going to address to Katrina. Uh, Katrina, as you're both a member of the Survivors Council, as well as ECPAT USA's Board of Directors, uh, to set the foundation for the rest of this webinar so we all have a clear understanding, could you explain to our audience what is child sex trafficking? Absolutely, thank you. Um, child sex trafficking occurs when someone that's under 18 um, is bought or sold for the sexual purpose and exploitation. Um, it often occurs through force, coercion, um, or even fraud. Um, if that child consents, it's sex trafficking. If they initiate, it's, sex tra it's still sex trafficking. Um, the, the challenge that we have is as long as there's a continuous demand, we will continue to have the issue. And that's as simple as it gets. Great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this question up to any of you to answer. Uh, and this, I think this is an important question, and I think it will help give some clarity, I think, as to uh, the issue of uh, trafficking in the United States. Who is being trafficked? I would say an answer to that, you know, 
my first response to who is being trafficked is um, trafficking is about vulnerability being exploited. And um, we're all vulnerable at some point in our lives and certain populations are uh, more vulnerable than others at certain times. And that is what uh, predators prey upon, vulnerabilities. Whether it's a 35-year-old um, man who's trafficked for labor trafficking uh, purposes or a um, young person in the foster care system. Um, as, I, as I just said, there are certain populations that are obviously more vulnerable than others at, at, at many times during their lives, but we are all vulnerable at some point in our life. And that's what traffickers prey upon, vulnerabilities. And as long as there's demand uh, for this, um, there's, there's, there's gonna be predators preying upon vulnerable people. As, as a child that went through the juvenile and, and foster care systems, I was very vulnerable. So it's vulnerability that's being preyed upon. That's just my, my two cents on that. I totally agree with you. Um, and you know, oftentimes they want to place a label of who this person is, what they look like, this cookie cutter, um, right. of who's being trafficked. And I agree with you 110%. It's the vulnerability, not necessarily that person, who they are, where they're from, what they look like. It's the vulnerability. Um, there's one trafficker that, uh, now speaks out on, um, his past when he was younger. And one thing that he would always say is that he would walk through the mall and he would particularly look for, um, young children that were by themselves. Right. And, and when he saw them alone, he would also pay attention to their body language. So, you know, the child that you walk up to and say, Hey, your shirt is beautiful or hi, I like your hair. And if they looked him, looked him in the eye and said, thank you and kept walking, he knew to keep going. But it was that child that looked at their feet when you gave a compliment. And that there triggered, you know, the, the, it told him everything that he needed to know about that person. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's very, that's very fascinating. So traffickers are very good at pinpointing the, the vulnerability. Yes, I don't want to give them any positive attributes, but they are uh, expert in what they are exploiting and trying to do, which is turn a human being into a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I, can you guys hear me now? Yes, I can. I was going to say the same thing. It's, it's the vulnerability. It's, it, it does, it's something that, it's something about that, that just, you can tell when somebody, um, in, in my experience, all the girls that I, I, came across with it was always the same thing yes um oh, yeah it's unfortunately yes are there any particular vulnerabilities that make one um that people should pay attention to uh when it comes to I, I mean low self-esteem you know if if a child hasn't been given the opportunity to have these positive role models in their lives and they have not had their self-esteem developed, um, you know. And, and once again, this is what traffickers and predators look for. Um, and 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 that's why I encourage everyone, when I uh, try to educate them about this issue, to 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 build that wall of self-esteem around children. Mm -hmm. That's just what I think. Yeah. Sure. We answered the question: Who is being trafficked? Or uh, got a sense of who's being trafficked. Now, the other, the follow-up question is, who are the traffickers? I think um, it, there's a broad list of of people that, that can be traffickers. It could be the 23-year-old guy that a 12-year-old is speaking to on Instagram. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be your neighbor. It could be the guy you work with. You you never know. There's um there's not There's not a set characteristic or look or it's not a just one type of trafficker there's there's so many uh, especially nowadays with with social media and everything you know it's it's very yes. easy to fall into something you know you, you're thinking you oh you met a new friend but in reality this is this guy who's looking for these vulnerable girls who's online uh, showing off a lifestyle that you think you need or you want sure. you know it's just Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not that Hollywood uh, portrayal of the traffic. Sure. Um, how, 
How much of trafficking is involved of strain of uh, of strangers uh, kidnapping children? We know that that happens, but is that the majority of trafficking? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> then, well, what would yeah? So, I guess the follow-up question then: Who? If, what is? How has trafficking usually gone about? Not necessarily the process, but is is it who would it who would it be in terms of who is being trafficked? Who is is it a person in uh, authority? Is it a trust someone who has a relationship with the with the child? No, it's no. Like, yeah. Because I've seen it where with some girls they would have a child of that same age befriend them. And, uh, you know, years ago, you would label that as a trafficker as well, but no, she's also a victim. Right. So it would be what they would consider like peer recruitment. Uh. Um, so they would then friend them and, you know, then introduce them to the trafficker um, over time. And it's, it's a process. It's not just, oh, we snatched the child off the street and now, you know, you see her online it's it's a little bit more detailed than that and it's very different for every single girl and every right. boy like it's very different what that looks like it could be the young man that just got kicked out the house because his father found out that he was gay mm -hmm. and what does that look like at this point where does he sleep where does he eat but again he's still a child so you know it just it looks very different person by person Right. Exactly. Yeah. This next question I'm going to address to Barbara. Okay. So Barbara, uh, some of the the posts we see online of trafficking, um, a lot of them discuss uh, handcuffing children, tying them up, uh, locking them in cages underground. How accurate are those descriptions, would you say? I would say that the um, more slightly more recent surge of uh, this misinformation is not accurate, in my opinion. Sure. Now, while I was being trafficked, I was experiencing extreme violence and um, brutal uh, uh, beatings and all of that. Um, but Initially, I was not locked in a basement or handcuffed in a white van uh -huh. uh, and taken off of the street or packed into a box of furniture and shipped across the country. Um, it, was, it was after I was being programmed, and I use that word purposefully, by the trafficker uh, to follow his many rules that the violence set in and, you know, uh, the beatings and, and, and all of the violence set in. But initially, no, I, I mean, though this, this misinformation is, is not correct. Um, I was actually asked that question one time after I'd spoken for an hour and shared all my experiences. I was asked during Q&A, so were you locked in the basement? And no, I was not locked in the basement. Um, when it, so, yeah, no. Sure. And, if that's the case, if there are children who are not tied up, this is, a, uh, I think, a, a very oh. good question. Yeah, and I think you know where I'm going to go with this. If children are not tied up, then what is stopping them from leaving? Why? I have this question I get all the time, and I'm sure the other panelists have gotten it uh, as well. And I, and addressing this question, why didn't you just leave? How could that be possible? How could 12 years to 24? Actually, I didn't even know how old I even was. I was surprised by the time I... In New York City, uh, but I was it was 24. Um, uh, why didn't you just leave? Why did you just pack it up and leave at some point? Um, and 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 that's when I speak to the, the formation of the trauma bond or Stockholm syndrome and the psychological game. Uh, it's called, that it's called. It's not a game at all. But that's what the psychological impact of that exploitation, um, where the victims not just myself, form a bond with the predator, with the trafficker. And this is what it's all about. You know, it's not about the handcuffs and being, you know, thrown into a van. It's about that, 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 that 
psychological exploitation and manipulation of a young mind, of a mind, of any mind. And um, I didn't even know I was a victim. You know, and that's a whole nother conversation about how do you provide services for victims that know they are. I didn't know I was a victim for many years until finally I, I did come to that epiphany and realization. But at any rate, I didn't just leave because I, I thought it was my choice. And that is, once again, part of the whole flipping, the whole putting into place that trauma bond. Um, choice is a very tricky word. Choice is a word that can be looked at in much more depth. Um, at one point, I have to say, I did leave one time, and I made it from New York City back to Washington, D.C., and he came and got me and brought me back. But it, it, it's, it's, it's a very complicated question. Why didn't you just leave it? it um, yeah, that's a really good question. Sure. Katrina, Siglali, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, my experience, personally, I, I was allowed to walk outside. I could go to the store by myself. I could, we would, I could go to the mall with my, uh, with my trafficker. And again, it's the same thing. I felt like he was doing me a favor. Right. He was helping me out. As if I left, I, I'd be in the wrong. I wouldn't, nobody would love me the way that he did. Right. And nobody would treat me the way that they did, you know? So I get that question all as well. And I used to ask myself that all the time. Well, why didn't you leave? You had every single option. And, and again, it's, it's, it's taken a lot of time for me to realize, you know, it's, it was in my mind at that moment i i would tell i told myself you know it's it's you know it's your you just can't you know you you'll never be able to survive alone you know so right. it, it you know it that every time i hear that question it kind of just like oh wow you know it makes you think all over and over again oftentimes when i'm asked that question um i reference domestic violence victims um they say it takes seven times for them to leave before they are done with that partner yeah. Uh, I also, you know, just to to make the 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 mindset relatable when asked that question, I will ask, well, why hadn't you lost those 30 pounds you've been struggling with for the past few years? Why hadn't you stopped smoking? Because that same mental shift that has to happen in making those decisions are exactly the same that you have to make as a victim to decide to be done no matter what and the fear of staying has to become greater than the fear of leaving. Mm -hmm. And any time before that, it's the fear of leaving that's so much stronger than the fear of staying because you know what you're gonna get there. Regardless of what that abuse is and how horrific it is and regardless of the trauma, you know what's there. What's on the other side of that is unknown and often scary and oftentimes the traffickers, because they've isolated you, um, yeah. because so much shame involved around the experience you feel like you have no way out exactly. and, you know it's 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 all in the mind yeah definitely thank you thank you all three for answering that i think that's a a very important point that uh, people don't take into account when we're talking about trafficking i think and i'm sure all, all you three are aware and it's partially why we're here today there is a lot of attention that is being brought to child trafficking uh, and a lot of it has to do with the proliferation of conspiracy theories. Uh, what, this is a, a, a question to any of you three who want to answer, what thoughts and feelings come up uh, as attention is now being brought to trial trafficking on social media? You know, I, I get this, um, I, me and, and Lori talked about this earlier a couple of days ago, and you, you get these crazy conspiracy theories, you know, the children being sacrificed and, and these, these articles online that just make absolutely no sense. And I think the more people post it and the more people share it, they, they kind of, uh, what's the word? they make child trafficking this little thing, you know, they make, they put more attention to these crazy ideas and you're, you're forgetting that, you know, there's kids out there that are actually missing. You know, there's, you know, a lot of these women, um, a lot of these children are actually going through something and you're making it so minuscule by, by saying, Oh, well, it's only happening Hollywood or it's only these celebrities that are, that are doing it. And, and, you know, they're not really looking at the bigger picture. Sorry, I, think, I, I just, I'm, I'm trying to think how to verbalize this. I think oftentimes 
when an issue um, comes to the forefront, uh, it, it can be good and a bad thing, you know, I mean, um, and, and like you just said, Miguel, this issue has, is, has kind of um, come to the forefront in the, you know, re, you know quite a bit recently. And um, certain entities can um, take an issue and um, kind of put their own agenda on it. And um, this issue is one of them. Um, for whatever reason, certain entities can um, kind of um, do that, you know, put their own agenda, whatever that may be, and attach it to this to the to an issue such as trafficking. And I think that's what's happening with some of these conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. Personally, certainly, and that and that kind of brings up uh, another question. I'll go ahead and get straight to um, the conspiracy theories. They're bringing attention to child trafficking, isn't that right? A thing? Well, like I said, it's a good thing and a bad thing. You know, it's it's no, it's not a good thing if their agenda is uh, whatever it may be. Um, you know, it, it, it's 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 not a good thing if they're 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 delivering misinformation to the to the American people to the to the world. Sure. Uh, no, that's not a good thing. <laughs> it's definitely not a good thing. Uh, Vicvali, Katrina, uh, either of you want to add anything? No, I definitely agree. Um, the way the information is, um, because right at this point, there's a lot of unlearning that has to happen to understand and learn right. what it really looks like. And I mean, we're grateful for forums like this, um, where you're able to have that conversation. Uh, but the reality is how, you know, how do you reach everyone? You know, how do we begin to have that conversation um, that's just bringing awareness to what that real conversation is? Yeah, yeah. I agree. For sure. All right, we'll move on to the uh, following question. Um, I'm going to address uh, this question to Siklali. Uh, Siklali, uh, with the proliferation of uh, conspiracy theories, uh, what would you say to those who have recently become concerned about child trafficking as a result from the spread of these conspiracy theories? I feel like if you want to inform yourself and you actually want to do something to, you know, to educate yourself on, on sex on child sex trafficking and actually want to do something about it, it's important to reach out to organizations like this. Exactly. Educate yourself a little bit. Uh, it might sound kind of crass, but I tell people Google is free you know, you always have the option to look things up and, and, um, and get yourself informed. You know, you, there's a lot of volunteering that you can do. There's, you know, you can reach out to certain places. If you are, if you are a nurse or you work for the medical field, reach out to a couple places that offer, um, teach you these signs of how, how do you, how you can tell if one of your, your patients is, is a victim of sex trafficking. You know, there's, there's so many things that you can do besides, listening to these weird uh, conspiracy theories and going online and, and reading these fake fake news situation things. And I just think, like I said, Google is free and organizations like this is amazing, you know, it you because you can just go online and you figure out who you can speak to. You can you can reach a lot of these board members and you can do a lot of it yourself. So I think there's if you want to do something about it, you can. You just have to want to put in the work, you know. Right. Can, can I say one little thing? Please. I would like to agree completely with what you just said. And I would like to also say, again, like you just mentioned, reaching out to organizations such as ECPAT that have the correct information and are able to educate you on the reality of what human trafficking truly is, um, are, is just so very, very important. And also the fact that ECPAT includes the survivor voice, because I have a hashtag, nothing about us without us. And by that, I mean exactly what we're doing here tonight and what ECPAT, I'm honored to say, I'm a part of the you know, Survivor Council. And it's very, very, very important because there are many uh, entities that, that have no inclusion at all of the, of the survivor voice. So reaching out to organizations like ECPAT and getting the correct information is very, very, very important. Sure. 
I'm what I, I guess what I hear is a uh, re -ed yeah, definitely uh, educate yourself. We have the resources, right? Uh, and and then to um, link up with organizations that have been doing the work. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's great. What can people do practically to help uh, fight human trafficking? And this is open. This is whoever wants to answer. I mean, awareness is key. Awareness is key. It could start as simply with your block, your neighborhood, awareness is key. Um, there's never been a speaking engagement that I've not done with, you know, high schoolers and middle school children where several students did not walk up at the end and explain to me a situation where, oh, I think this may be happening to my friend. Or, right. oh, I think I might have been approached by a trafficker. And so awareness is key. Awareness is key. And I think it's also um, key to note that service providers for victims of sex trafficking, um, everyone's not made to volunteer and provide direct services. Um, it, it's a long road. It's a long, long road. This is not something that you could just show up on the weekend. <laughs> and give your time. It's not like giving food to the hungry. Not the same. Um, so oftentimes in those cases, I tell them, write a check because the financial resources that are needed, you're pulling a young girl or boy is coming from a lifestyle that was supported by that trafficker on every level in every way. Yeah. And they are transitioning in a space where they need to now be able to support themselves. Exactly. And what that look like. For sure. So oftentimes service providers whether it's programs that provide stipends for like educational achievements or housing, all those things cost money. Yes. And no, you may not have time to volunteer. You may not be built for that type of work or mentoring. So you write the check. Uh -huh. What did you bring up? A, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 you're fine. Go ahead. I was just gonna. I was just gonna add. I think your your response is very enlightening because I think one of the key indications or at least key um, in my own research for writing the article uh, one of the key factors of trafficking is poverty yes and and that's you know that's been one of the you know things that's come up time and time again uh, you know when we're talking about vulnerability it's you know nothing makes someone more vulnerable than you know lack of financial means to survive day to day and uh, Along with that, as we're talking about awareness that uh, that has come up, what, aware what, to be more specific, are we talk? We're talking not so much awareness of what's going on on social media, uh, not so much of what the awareness of what you know what theories are uh, propagating and what people are uh, saying, but awareness of our own. Uh, what awareness are we talking about? And I, we've touched on it, but I just want to make sure we're very clear what we're being aware of. The awareness that this is, this is going on in your own backyard. Yeah. And I don't care where you are in the country, it's going on in your backyard. Whether it's from who's buying it, who's supplying it. This is, not, this is not a conversation of something that's happening way over there and doesn't involve me and all oh, these poor little kids. Again, like Barbara said, we're all vulnerable. We all have those vulnerabilities. And it's kind of the unperfect timing with a trafficker that has connected with that vulnerability that now we have this issue where there's a child trapped in the life. Yeah, very much so. And, and that word that you mentioned, transition, and um, you know, giving those donations to assist a survivor in that transition. Uh, briefly, I felt like I was returning from another planet when I was able to leave that criminal underworld. That complete isolation, um, I cannot reiterate enough as, as you know, uh, of not knowing what the real, this world was, even was anymore. Uh, and what was I supposed to do? Was I supposed, what was I supposed to do? I, I left school in the sixth grade. I, I didn't even, I mean, was I supposed to get an education, get a job? I, 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 you know, what was I supposed to do and how was I supposed to do it? And that takes so much time and that transition, right? And so many, many, many services and those all require a lot of time and finances. 
and not to mention health. That could be a whole nother webinar. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I agree with everything you just said. I'm, I think, uh, yeah, we covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. So thank you three for those questions from me. Uh, we are now going to uh, transition. That's the word that came up. But we're now going to transition from our moderator the discussion now to the question and answer period. When the, this actually involves the Me Too movement. Um, when the Me Too movement first began in, to grow in 2017, did you feel empowered by this? Or did you feel it doesn't align with your experiences and takes and focus off of survivors of sex trafficking? I think that's a very interesting question. And um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's a good question. Well, I think that it, it was what it was. And it was necessary for what it is and what it stands for. Um, right. It didn't take any attention or light off of sex trafficking because sex trafficking is that as well. Right. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't, it definitely, you know, it helps give, I guess, a bit of range and scope of all the violence towards women that uh, exist. Uh, but I definitely don't feel as if it took the light away from the actual sex trafficking movement and what that looked like because the Me Too movement is also that what it's right. is also a piece of sex trafficking. Yeah, I agree with that. It, it didn't take away. Um, I didn't feel like it took away from. Perfect. Question, here's a, a question is, what are survivors thoughts on decriminalizing prostitution and its impact on trafficking survivors? Oh. Can I say something about that? Go ahead. Um, I, I, <laughs> was Katrina. Um, okay, I live in the Washington DC area and I, I, I'm trying to be real brief about this. I testified against the DC decrim bill, um, which was slickly renamed uh, from the original name of the legislation, by the way, that did not pass that was slickly renamed the Health and Safety Act. And my testimony involved something like this. Um, that was a very slick move renaming this legislation the Health and Safety Act. However, there's nothing healthy or safe about uh, this issue. And um, it, it, there, there are numerous studies. I, I, can't, I could go on for hours about this issue. Um, but there are numer num numerous studies that have shown that any, 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 any decriminalization, any of that happening in anywhere has only increased human trafficking. It hasn't caused a deficit in human trafficking. And basically trying to, you know, make money off of legalizing this and turning the nation's capital into, um, I don't know, Las Vegas was not a good idea. But no, I do not agree with that um, at all. I don't think that um, it helps in any area uh, legal, legalizing um, prostitution. As someone who was arrested numerous times in, in, in New York City, it, you know, it, it, even though I was a minor and, and I obtained a criminal record, it still wouldn't have assisted me at all if it was legalized because they would only have been taxing the trafficker and making more money off of him. So no, I don't agree with that. Katrina, Lalia, your thoughts? Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I have the same mentality. I don't think it would help, you know. Uh, it's it's a it's a tricky question um, because I I dabbled in in sex work after I was rescued and you know regardless of the matter it's it's still to me I still felt like it was I was being trafficked so no I don't I don't think it would assist anybody you know is what signs for trafficking should teachers look, be looking for to identify possible trafficking among their students. Wow. Um, and a follow-up question. As I'm sorry, one more. And then, uh, for each of you, for each of you, if you could think and share what you would have wanted your teachers or guidance counselors, um, any adult authorities that would have helped you, or could have been able to help you, what what would you have wanted them to look for? Well, definitely looking for those voids. You know, you you know, yeah. you can quickly identify the child that is wearing the same pair of clothes multiple times a week. Um, you can identify the child that doesn't have a lot of uh, self-esteem. You can identify the child who is consistently 
um, not doing well in school. And it's a combination of things. It's not just that one thing, you know, uh, not doing well at school. Um, I had one young girl that I was working with and the way that we found out, and it was a guidance counselor that contacted us, is she was falling asleep a lot in class. Mm. And it's like, it wasn't just, you know, oh, I hung out over the weekend and I didn't get sleep. No, it was a consistent, always tired, not engaged, wow. um, not focused. Um, and then those who tend to miss multiple days of school. Yes. Basically. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Question two, how, how can victims get help? <laughs> you know, I think, oh, I'm sorry. Can I say something? Go ahead. Go. You know, I think that is such a, that, that question is such an important question because I would say, uh, I don't, I, I wasn't ever going to go running into a police station and go, help me, help me. I'm a victim of sex trafficking. I didn't know I was a victim and I don't, I don't know. I, I talked about that previously, you know, it, it's uh, such a deep um, programming of a mind where you don't even think you are a victim. So it's very difficult for first responders and health professionals and, 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 and service providers to provide services for someone who doesn't even think they are a victim, oh. you know? So um, first, that trauma needs to be addressed in a truly trauma-informed manner. And that, tr that term, trauma-informed, is bandied about quite frequently today. Um, and, and I think people need to really educate themselves on being truly trauma-informed and, 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 and starting off that long journey of that transition that Katrina mentioned earlier. I had the option of going to Rikers or going to a incarceration alteration or it was an incarceration alternative program. Okay. So for many people, they have to hit rock bottom. And even when I went through that, you cannot tell me that my trafficker was my trafficker. You cannot, you couldn't have told me that. That's right. Victim. There's at the worst thing that you can do with a victim is tell them they're a victim. Oh, and that, um, I've seen it turn out in other people's cases very badly because at that point, that person shuts down. Yep. They're wanting to be involved. They don't want to hear anything that you've said at that point. No. The best thing that you could do if, if you happen to come across um, is the basic, how was your day? How are you feeling? You know, what makes you smile? What makes you, you know, what brings you joy? Those types of questions begin to open that I door within the mind that, it, that, you know, it, it takes time. It takes I, time. I agree with you so much. And Miguel, can I share one short thing, please? I, I, I really agree with you so much, Katrina. It takes so much time and I just have to share this very briefly. Uh, I made it out of New York City because I had hit that bottom, that rock bottom. I already been in Rikers Island. I already done all of that, all those years. And, and, and I walked, I was heavily addicted to heroin. I went into some clinic on the Lower East Side and it was the receptionist. She wasn't a psychologist. She wasn't a psychiatrist. She wasn't a doctor. She took time to look me in my eyes and, and I don't want to cry, but she made me feel like a human being. She made me feel like I mattered. <laughs> She, this person, it wasn't her job. She was just to do an intake. What are you here for? But she truly, it washed over me. It truly connected when she gave me eye contact and nobody has time today, but she, and she took time to make me feel like a human being. And it went much further than that after that day. But she initially took time with me to treat me like I mattered. And it made all the difference. And that's why I left New York. That's and I, that. <laughs> and I think that's an overall void that we have in our human uh, experience now. That is part of the reason that the voids and the vulnerabilities exist because of how we treat one another. Yes. Um, that matters. You know, that matters to make a point, look someone in the eye and say, Hi, you know, granted we're in New York City and it's like, you know, it, but <laughs> so, and I do, I do. And people probably think I'm crazy for it, but I, even a look and a smile goes so far, so far. 
and you just you never know and taking that time taking the time oh no oh time and listening um I'm sorry i don't know what just i did okay yeah i totally i totally you know she asked me what kind of what i liked you know did i like this i, I don't know she treated me like a human being a re, like a fellow human being oh. not like a client and I know all service providers are very busy and everything, but she took time to treat me like a fellow human being. And yeah. it made all the difference in my, in, in, it did. Um, so Bali, did you have anything you want to add? Um, no, I mean, I had something, same thing that Barbara said. I mean, the way that I asked for help was I, same thing happened to me, except my, with mine, it was a doctor. Um, she was great. I went in because I was having some pains. Turns out it was a cyst, but you know, she, she asked me some questions that she could tell something was wrong. I'm, I'm so certain that she had some kind of training beforehand, you know, and again, she made me feel safe. She made me feel great. I had, you know, I, I've never felt actually somebody who, she genuinely cared. That's what it was. Right. She genuinely cared. Like she was worried. She could tell some signs. And she said, I remember it clearly because I was laying on the bed and she came in and she was like, can I speak to you for a second? She asked me how I was, you know, she asked me what I like to do, my name. And that's when, when I was like, this is, this is my chance. This is where I can, I, somebody actually wants to help, you know, and that's just it. That's just someone who actually cares, you know, genuinely shows yeah. you some kind of compassion and, and wants to make sure that you're okay. That's, that's what did it for me. That just came up. It has been mentioned that uh, decriminalization will not work. Uh, can other models, such as the equality model, uh, can, I guess, can they assist? I don't know. The Nordic model, the equality model, you know, ending demand. We haven't talked about demand uh, in depth because that would be a whole nother webinar, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. but, um, you know, instead of, you know, addressing the demand and and the um i always struggle with the correct terminology the buyers um, addressing them in more depth instead of um just decriminalizing the whole issue would be a better model in my opinion uh. i agree i totally agree um i mean <laughs> as we have all or not learned in economics class it's like supply and demand right that's it uh, what would you say to someone who endorses sex work on the premise that it's empowering to individuals oh is voluntarily or is voluntarily engaging in this work detrimental to individuals as the I, I i just have to say that i never one time in my entire time spent being a, a exploited had one person or including myself or anyone come up to me and say you know what I just had to do that 20 times today and I feel great. I am empowered. And by the way, my health is fantastic as well because as a survivor of uterine cancer and I now currently ha have been diagnosed with CML leukemia I, that I'm quite certain is directly related to the fact that I was sex trafficked. I'm not a, 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 do a medical doctor, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I, it, there is no, I, I just don't buy it. It's not empowering. That's just my two cents. No, I mean, I definitely agree. Uh, I guess nowadays in, in the social media age, uh, there's a lot of sex workers and everybody. It's it's so, um, so renowned, you know, that you have the OnlyFans and stuff like that. Me personally, I think it's, it's just BS. You know, I, I know, I know what I went through and I never, to this day, I don't feel like it's something that I'd want to broadcast all over the internet. And I don't think it's something that I'd be, you know, so excited to say, hey, you know what, this is great. You know, I, but that's just, you know, that's just me. That's mm -hmm. just how I feel. I agree. That's what it is. Okay. Uh, so in Nexium, the, the sex cult, uh, um, uh, the daughter of the movie celebrity, uh, she talked about being indoctrinated. Um, and is the experience of these survivors the same? Do they feel that they were indoctrinated, indoctrinated or brainwashed? That's when I speak about the trauma bond and program. Yeah. And I use that word purposefully. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from the initial moment when I was handed over to the trafficker from uh, New York, he began that process on the way up to the city, and he began very smoothly that process. There are certain precursors that, that are formed, you know, when a trauma bond is being put into place. Uh, one of them is fear for one's life, and he made sure I saw that he had a big Glock right there. Another one is taking on the worldview of the uh, predator. 
um, you know, there are different, so, so yes, uh, programming, I've actually written about the similarities between cults and, 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 and uh, trauma bonding and, and all of that. But at any rate, yeah, I believe there are similarities, personally. No, I mean, I definitely agree. Absolutely. I mean, just the definition of indoctrination, I prefer the term trauma bond because um, it's, it's so much, it, it's so much relatable to the actual experience. Yes. Um, and Dr. Nate kind of makes it yeah, more of like textbook and, you know, get, not as much, um, everyone can familiarize with trauma. Everyone yeah. can relate to bonds. So, you know, I think the verbiage is super important as well. And I, I agree using that term purposely, um, just takes all the, the <laughs> camera off of it. It's, yeah, it's, Dr. Nate, it just has, it just gives a wrong, a, a wrong connotation to the whole, to the whole issue. It does, doesn't it? Words are so important, the words we use, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I still see articles, I still see people using the terminology child prostitute, and I cringe, you know, um, anyway, words are very important. Um, if you had the opportunity to speak to every government official, uh, politician, law enforcement, judiciary in the U.S., what would you say to them on how to reduce and remove human trafficking um, that they may not uh, understand? Wow. I will start off with accountability. Mm. <laughs> um, because I'm, you know, I can't speak for anyone else's experience on the panel, but I know how often I came in contact with those that were in those roles. Yes. <laughs> And oftentimes the colleague will turn the head and, you know, that's, yes. that's just Joe being Joe, you know, and not accountability. That would be first and foremost. I feel that that's one of the reasons um, we've had such a hard time um, demolishing and reducing demand. I was exactly it goes back to demand right yeah exactly it, it goes back to demand and um if we begin to uh, hold those accountable um there's a lot of people at the top that will be in a lot of trouble you know um we had an executive of a fortune 500 company in georgia that was caught um in a sting operation and because of his wealth and his position, there was one news article written. It did not meet, it did not reach the, um, the TV stations. It right. came so quickly because of his position and his power. Yeah. And that cannot continue to happen if we're truly addressing the demand. If truly, 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 right. It's two minutes past. I'm going to respect everyone's time. I, I certainly want to thank you three for uh, participating uh, in this webinar. Um, it's a very emotionally difficult topic. And I think I can speak for all of us when we're very, to say that we're very appreciative of both your bravery and your commitment to assuring that uh, yeah, the other children can grow up safely. So for more information about um, what ECPAT USA does and Survivor Council, you can visit the ECPAT USA website at www.ecpatusa.org. Uh, you can find interviews with council members in the Survivor's Perspective Series. Um, and that website, it will contain some free resources for young people and educators, as well as members of the private sector to help stop human trafficking in our communities as well as information on the current federal, federal advocacy campaigns uh, to shut down online child exploitation. Additionally, please read about ECPAT USA's work to raise awareness in the age of conspiracy theories online with Sojourners at uh, sojo.net. Uh, in the chat, I just put in the uh, article that was published today that uh, included actually one of our panelists, Barbara Amaya, uh, she was interviewed for this piece. And uh, uh, this, again, thank you all so much and have a wonderful evening. You all as well. And I'm going to do a shameless plug for my book because it includes a resource, an informative guide to teachers, counselors, law enforcement, medical personnel, parents and caregivers and young men and women 
and my website's barbaramaya.com. Of course, I can be reached through Ekpat. My, the name of my book is Nobody's Girl. It was honored to be here tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. It was an honor for me to be, to be here. So thank you for allowing me to ask these questions. Well, for all of you who are watching, thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.